Hello, everyone. Uh, in this webinar, I'm going to tell you about the application of single cell and spatial omics technologies in plant biology, um, using our own research as some examples. And today, um, I'm not going to tell you or give you um, a detailed uh, tutorials about data analysis or sample prep. Uh, there are many good uh, tutorials online resources available. Um, but I try to instead uh, provide some key concepts and important considerations uh, in planning your uh, next single cell experiments. So uh, let's get started. So as you imagine, there are many cases where single cell and spatial omics can be quite useful. Uh, here I highlight a few uh, cases. So first of all, you know, plants are made of different cell types and different cell types have different functions and they have also different molecular networks. So ideally, any measurement should be done in a cell type aware way. Um, so I think it's this concept that we would separate root and shoot whenever possible to gain more information. If no difference, you can just combine them afterwards. So of course, there's a cost barrier right now in single cell experiments, but it's going to change uh, quickly. So I think it will be beneficial to be prepared for that. And perhaps more complicated scenario would be when you deal with various cell states and identities within the same uh, developmental cell type. And these can be affected by various uh, factors such as cell intrinsic factors like uh, cell cycles or cell extrinsic factors such as environmental stimuli. And I'm particularly interested in microbial colonization to plants, uh, which creates lots of heterogeneity in the host, uh, where it, which could be, which you could appreciate in this confocal image of a Arabidopsis leaf infected by bacteria pathogen. And today I will use this model system to showcase the power of single cell and spatial omics technologies. But no, really, you know, any other environmental stimuli can create a lot of heterogeneity. So here, um, please let me introduce a little more about various sources of heterogeneity in plant microbe interactions. So again, you know, different cell types of the host plants can have different ability to respond to microbial colonization. And also cells can communicate with each other and such cell cell communication can be affected by spatial coordinations between cells. And also this temporal axis. So over time, individual cells change their responses. And importantly, microbial colonization pattern can also change over time and their activity change over time. So uh, which further introduces heterogeneity. And, and then again, this can be applied to, you know, other environmental stimuli, which are them by themselves are quite heterogeneous. So to tackle such tissue heterogeneity, new technologies. Um, so in, in this slide, I will highlight, you know, what new technologies uh, offer to tackle such heterogeneity problem. So uh, I, I use uh, some analogy here. So, you know, now you can study individual cells as uh, building blocks of the tissue. And the first thing you might want to do is to classify cells into populations, um, the functional units, in this case, cell types and states. Um, so the, in this analogy, you know, individual music instruments. And then uh, you can ask what kind of sound each instrument can make. That's a gene expression or protein expression potential of different cell types or cell states. And then you can also ask how these instruments are played. That's a gene regulatory mechanisms or uh, any post-transcriptional modifications at the single cell level. And after understanding each instrument in isolation, you can put them back to the actual context they are played uh, with spatial and temporal uh, information to, to understand the symphony. So that's you know, what, what, what's actually happening in the tissue. And new single cell and spatial omics technologies offer uh, opportunities to create different kinds of cell atlases uh, in plants or any other organisms. So at each step, so cell type atlases and gene regulatory atlases and spatial temporal atlases. And I'm going to quickly go through uh, these uh, different kinds of applications. So for the cell type atlasing, the most commonly used technology is single cell transcriptomics, uh, which 
has been instrumental for creating uh, a lot of different cell, uh, cell atlases in different organisms. Here I'm showing a few recent examples. Um, and one important consideration in single cell RNA-seq in plants is that whether uh, we should use protoplast or nuclei. Um, and there are pros and cons for both approaches. So for flow plasting, uh, you, you know, the good thing is you get whole cell information, and which means you get more genes and more molecules. But the downside is it's known that the protoplasting, protoplast isolation introduces a lot of gene expression changes. Thousands of genes can, can change. And also uh, protoplast isolation can be difficult for some tissue types. And plus, you know, the plant cells have variable uh, sizes, so which could uh, further introduce biases during a uh, library plant. On the other hand, uh, nuclear approach is good in, in a way that the isolation protocol can be more versatile. Um, and also the nuclear isolation can be done more quickly and also on ice. So it can uh, uh, low, which can lower the background, you know, the gene expression of protein expression changes. Uh, however, um, you will lose the, the whole cell uh, information. So it's, you know, it's just nuclei, although it can be considered as nascent transcripts. Um, and also, you know, you, you will lose cytosolic RNA, so you get shallower uh, data, which I think could be overcome by uh, collecting uh, or sequencing more uh, nuclei. So I think uh, you need to be aware of these uh, uh, pros and cons. And in our lab, uh, we uh, we mainly use the nucleus uh, approach. So for the atlasing, so we have uh, created recently a single nucleus transcriptome atlas of Arabidopsis that covers the entire life cycle of the plant. So we we took uh, many different tissue types and from across different developmental stages. Um, and we uh, have generated, um, we, we have sequenced over 800,000 cells uh, from those different tissues. And we identified uh, 183 major clusters and over 600 subclusters. So there are distinct cell populations with uh, distinct transcriptome patterns. And um, many of the clusters could be annotated as, you know, with uh, known cell types and cell states. But there are many other cell uh, clusters um, that are that are not annotated yet. So it's it's astonishing, you know, how many um, cell populations we could identify, and I think that's the power of single cell sequencing study. And this data set can serve as a reference data set onto which we can add more uh, cells in the future from different conditions or different uh, mutant background and so on to understand how different cell populations operate in different uh, environmental conditions or you know, what's the genetic, um, uh, the molecular mechanism, molecular networks uh, in, in, in different types of cells, cell types. And then the next step is to understand the gene regulatory uh, mechanisms in each cell populations. And of course, the single cell RNA-seq can be useful in, 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 in such a task, but you know, there are many other information we can uh, use. So for example, the epigenetic information is uh, quite uh, important in this here. So there are many epigenetic changes, including histone modification, chromatin conformation, DNA methylation, et cetera. And epigenetic information allows us to further classify cell populations, but also uh, it allows us to identify uh, potential gene regulatory mechanisms in operates uh, in different uh, cell types. And among many epigenetic uh, profiles, the most commonly studied um, epigenetic changes in plants at the single cell level so far is chromatin accessibility. So as you might know, the chromatin can either be closed or open. An open chromatin region can be bound by transcription factors and cofactors to uh, activate or replace genes. So if you look at the open chromatin regions, you can uh, get potential regulatory regions. And this can be studied uh, at the single cell level using single cell attack seek. Um, 
And there are uh, two major ways. So one is droplet-based ataxic, and, and another way is the plate-based combinatorial indexing. So both use uh, TN5, uh, which attacks the open chromatin regions to introduce DNA tags. And then based on this tag, you can sequence the open chromatin region at the single cell level. And the single cell ataxic allows you to identify uh, accessible chromatin regions or ACRs uh, that are cell type specific and, and, you know, and such information cannot be gained in the, the traditional bulk uh, ataxic. So, so after getting, you know, the epigenetic information at the single cell level, uh, then an important task is to integrate, you know, gene expression and epigenetic changes at the single cell level. Uh, but it's known to be very challenging. So such integration um, problem, some people call it as a diagonal integration because you have to integrate both cells and also features from separate single cell RNA seq and single cell ataxic data. And that's really challenging. You, you, you will need to um, make a bold assumption about the cell type or cell state compositions in different data sets, or you need to assume the tight a link between gene expression and chromatin accessibility. So between features, uh, you know, in many cases, such we, we actually don't know whether we can make such an assumption. And although there are many, you know, new computational uh, approaches to tackle this challenge, you can experimentally overcome this limitation by doing single cell multi-omics, where you get both information from the same cell, so you don't have to worry about, you know, integrating cells. And, the, and then single cell multi-omics can provide a ground truth data onto which you can actually add, you know, separate uh, single cell RNA or single cell toxic in the future. So in today's webinar, I will show you one example of the application of single cell multi-omics. Uh, we used 10x genomics multi-om assay, uh, which uses a droplet-based technology and profile allows us to profile both RNA-seq and ataxic from the same uh, nuclei. And as I said earlier, uh, I, I'll, I'll show this uh, example uh, using this uh, plant pathogen uh, system. So um, we employ three different pathogens, uh, Pseudomonas syringi, this is a bacterial pathogen. Uh, DC3000 is a white type. It's a virulent pathogen which can cause diseases because uh, they can suppress plant immune system. Um, and there are two variants of DC3000, uh, which has, uh, which have uh, additional proteins that are recognized by plant immune receptors to trigger strong immunity called effector trigger immunity or ETI. Uh, and because of this uh, strong immunity, these pathogens are not virulent. So plants win. And as I also introduced, there's a temporal uh, uh, axis uh, you know, critically impacting the plant uh, heterogeneity. So we did time course. So the, the here, the goal is to understand heterogeneous gene regulatory systems associated with both disease and resistance. So this is the overview of the data set. This is a UMAP. Each dot is a cell or nuclei. Uh, nucleus, and they are uh, clustered based on transcriptome similar similarities. So, so this UMAP is whole, you know, solely based on the transcriptome data. And, and here I'm showing rough uh, annotation of cell types, of mesophyll cells, epidermis, and vasculature. And then by looking at individual clusters for their you know, marker genes and, uh, and it also functional enrichment analysis, I identify that these clusters are enriched with cells with uh, defense responses. So this means that the single cell RNA-C could capture not only uh, development of cell types, but also uh, cell states uh, induced by pathogen attack. So here's the, um, I'm showing actual expression of a gene, ISIS-1, which is a critical defense uh, related gene. And you can see nice induction of ICS1 in those two um, immune activating conditions, but not much in this immune suppressive condition. And an important thing is that even in those two conditions, only a subset of cells are uh, expressing ICS1 strongly, which means that the immune activation by pathogen is indeed heterogeneous. Now, 
Here's the ataxic data, again, uh, on the ICS-1 locus. And here, first I aggregated all the cells for each sample. So mimicking a bulk ataxic, uh, it's good to do for a sanity check. And, and you can see that the, there is an increased accessibility uh, on the upstream region of ICS-1 only when you see strong gene expression, uh, gene induction. So suggesting that the data quality uh, is pretty good. And now we can take advantage of the single cell taxic data. And this allows us to, for example, check the assess the chromatin accessibility for each cluster defined by the transcriptome. And here you can see that there is a specific induction of accessibility on this area, on this genomic region, uh, only in those cell populations where we see a strong uh, gene activation. So there is a strong link between the accessible chromatin region in this accessible chromatin region and uh, this gene. So the multi arm data allows us to, you know, make such link test such links uh, between any combination of, you know, genes and also chromatin accessible regions. So we've scanned a whole uh, entire genome and transcriptome for such links between ACRs and genes and found thousands, tens of thousands of links that are significantly correlated. And here is, um, um, I'm showing the distribution of such links uh, by the distance from transcription start sites. And you can see that the majority of links are found in at the very close proximity to the gene, uh, which are likely uh, promoters. But also it has a longer, long tail, uh, which means that there are AC, you know, ACRs farther away from the gene that uh, correlate very well with gene expression. So they could be uh, potential enhancers. So such linking linkage analysis uh, um, provides a lot of potential gene regulatory um, sequences. So the next question is, what kind of transcription factors might bind to those accessible and linked uh, chromatin regions? So what we could do is we can do a uh, motif enrichment analysis. This is just one of the examples. Uh, but here I compared motif accessibility, uh, a motif enrichment between mesophyll cells, Im so immune active mesophyll cells versus immune non-active mesophyll cells. And we found the enrichment of a bunch of walkie transcription factors that are known to be important for defense responses. So this uh, analysis could capture, you know, what we could expect. Um, so at the cell type specific level, so we can also extend this analysis to do, to ask, you know, what the transcription factors that might be important for different cell types or different cell states and so on. Um, but also, so so here basically we did um, motif enrichment analysis at the cluster level. So we lost some single cell information, but we can also uh, study motif enrichment at the single cell level by using uh, what's called motif activity score. So I'll explain that uh, using uh, Wagi 46 as an example. So this is a defense related transcription factor. So the motif activity score can be calculated for each cell and high score means that those cells, um, in those cells, Wagi 46 binding sites are more open uh, than just random chance. And the lower value means that those uh, regions are more closed. Mm -hmm. So in this example, so upon pasturing attack, those cells uh, showed more accessible WAGI-46 binding site, suggesting that WAGI-46 uh, might be important in those cells. And we can further test that by looking at WAGI-46 expression uh, itself. So here is a WAGI-46 mRNA expression. And then you see nice overlap pattern between this uh, epigenetic um, the, this uh, WAGI-46 motif activity based on a toxic and WAGI-46 mRNA expression based on the RNA-seq. So this suggests that, you know, WAGI-46 module is likely important in these cells. Then the next question is, what kind of genes are targeted by WAGI-46 transcription factor? And here we can use the, the linkage information. So we can ask to which genes uh, WAGI-46 motif containing ACR are linked. Based on this information, we could we identified many genes uh, as potential targets of WAGI-46, and we found many known immune genes, which makes sense, but also there are 
uh, genes that are not previously characterized as immune genes, so they could be novel uh, immune genes. So this type of analysis can uh, identify a lot of gene regulatory modules uh, in containing transcription factor and the potential cis regulatory element and then target genes at the single cell level. So it can be tissue uh, cell type specific, cell state specific. And this is just one of the examples using Walking 46, but there are hundreds of motif already known uh, based on previous ChIP-seq or DAP-seq. Uh, there's a database. So, you know, this type of analysis will give you a lot of potential uh, gene regulatory uh, modules, which can be validated in the future using mutants to identify um, new gene regulatory mechanisms that operate at the single cell level or cell type specific level. So I just, you know, showed you uh, one example using attack RNA multi l but there are many, many other multi l technologies. Virtually any combination of two uh, modalities could be uh, measured now. Uh, so as you can see in this uh, slide, so this is a 2020 review. Um, and here is uh, one of the most recent reviews, 2023. And, you know, if you look at, you know, what kind of technologies uh, were published after 2020, there are already uh, dozens of technologies, multi arm technologies out there. So it's really, the field is moving really fast, uh, but it's quite exciting. Okay, so now I switch gears to tell you uh, about spatial transcript, uh, spatial, spatial temporal atlases. So um, again, you know, the plant pasture interaction is an example. It's been known that um, plant defense responses are spatially coordinated. So this study used uh, two transgenic reporter plants um, to monitor the expression of two defense genes, PR1 and BSP2. And as you would see uh, in, this, in these movies, you see uh, different spatial and temporal uh, patterns in the expression of those two defense-related genes. Upon pathogen attack, these dark regions are the pathogen-infected area. And in such dynamics cannot be necessarily be captured in you know, this dissociation-based uh, single-cell omics. So this, you know, highlights uh, the importance of spatial gene expression analysis. So for this spatial gene expression analysis, um, the, a gold standard approach in plant biology field is to make a transgenic reporter lines, uh, which, you know, in many cases, one transgenic line per gene. And this works very well in many cases, and you can even you know, do live imaging as I showed in the previous slide. Um, so it's, it's, it's a gold standard. Uh, however, in the era of single cell omics, uh, such a method has some limitation. The first thing is the generation of tra transgenic lines can, be, can take time. So although it's not technically uh, too challenging, but you know, if you have hundreds of clusters to validate and hundreds of, uh, hundreds of clusters to annotate and many hundreds of marker genes to validate uh, the generation of hundreds of transgenic lines is going to be a daunting task, if not impossible. And also, as you get better technology with high sensitivity and higher throughput, you will be able to classify cells in, into populations at high, much higher granularity. And at this point, maybe you know a single gene uh, might not be enough to define a cell population. You might need a combination of genes. And also, if you want to understand the spatial relationships between different cell populations, you will have to map multiple genes at the same time in the same plant. And in such, you know, the multiplexity uh, of uh, this kind of transgenic approach is quite limited. You can do three or four genes maximum in one plant, but not more than this. So that's another limitation. And the third limitation is that in this uh, such a heterologous expression system, uh, you lack the uh, native genomic context because you know we don't know what's the minimum and sufficient, uh, uh, you know, and what's the necessary and sufficient genomic uh, the regulatory sequence for each gene. So we just systematically take like a one kb, two kb upstream, but it might not uh, be you know sufficient. So the reported gene expression. 
uh, may not faithfully capture the actual gene expression in situ. So because of these potential problems, um, ideally we need methods uh, that can do simultaneous spatial mapping of many genes without requiring transgenic line generation. And spatial transcriptomics is, is the method that can do exactly this. So, uh, and you know, there are a lot of different technologies in, in this area and I'll try to quickly summarize uh, some of the technologies. So I, I group them in three uh, different groups. Uh, it's not, you know, comprehensive. Uh, it's biased, but, you know, I tried to explain uh, many different kinds of uh, concepts here. So one is array-based technology, such as 10x Genomics Visium platform, which has been uh, applied to plant tissues already. So this technology uses um, a slide uh, with a lot of DNA probes, so the spatially barcoded DNA probes, so, so that those probes are spotted on the slide. And then you put this, the tissue section onto this uh, barcode, barcoded DNA probe, and then the RNA uh, will be transferred to the probes, and the probe will capture uh, mRNAs using oligo DT sequence. And then you make a next generation sequencing libraries and sequence it, and then especially uh, map it based on, uh, especially map the sequence reads based on the spatial barcode sequence. And the advantage of such method is it's unbiased uh, because you can use oligo DT um, capture probe, which can comprehensively capture mRNAs, but also you can modify this capture probe to even target you know, microbial uh, genes, which is uh, pretty cool. And, but the current limitation with such method is uh, the spatial resolution. So in case of Visium, uh, each spot size is 55 micron. So here's some uh, reference images uh, to show the size of the 55 micron. It's, it's pretty big, right? Um, but there are many other methods uh, being developed with uh, smaller and smaller uh, spot size, uh, you know, 10 micron for slice seek or, or down to sub micron for uh, more recent technologies and stereo seek uh, has been applied to plant uh, tissues. So the resolution problem may be overcome in the future. Also, also I, I don't mention you know, much today, but there are also many computational problems in clustering those cell, uh, those spot, barcoding, barcoded spots or uh, deconvoluting cell types from each spot. But you know, this is also an active area of research. So in uh, several years, those limitations could be overcome. Another approach is single molecule fish based. This is a microscope based approach and, and also uh, there are many different kinds of approaches. And uh, the advantage of single molecule fish based uh, technique is it has high spatial resolution because it's microscope based. And also single molecule fish is known to uh, known for its high sensitivity, the you know high capture efficiency. And some methods are uh, quite scalable. Uh, here I highlight two methods, Murfish and Sigfish Plus, which have both achieved 10,000 uh, gene detection in the same experiment, in the same tissue. Although many other uh, methods are uh, much lower throughput. So that's, that's one of the um, downsides. So it's, it's a targeted approach, not unbiased. And also, the, if your, your sample is big, uh, the imaging time can add up and so it can take a long time and uh, you know, it will generate a, a huge amount of data. So each experiment could be a terabyte of images. Uh, so the data management can be a challenge. And the third category is in situ sequencing. Uh, it also comes with uh, many flavors, uh, but the key feature is that the target mRNA will be replaced by DNA uh, by hybridizing, uh, you know, barcoded DNA probes or by uh, reverse transcription to make cDNA from mRNA. And then those DNA uh, DNAs are amplified hundreds of times in situ, and then the barcode sequence or cDNA sequence itself uh, is read in situ by different chemistries, such as sequence by ligation, sequence by synthesis, or sequence by hybridization. Um, 
In fact, the sequ sequence by synthesis is the chemistry used by the Illumina sequencer. So that's what's happening in, in the Illumina box. So in a way, you know, these methods are like, you know, Illumina sequencing in the actual tissue. So the advantage of this approach, this in-situ sequencing approach is again, this is a microscope based. So it has a high spatial resolution compared with array based. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the target DNA is amplified uh, many times. So it will give you a very strong signal. So high signal noise ratio, which might be important for deep tissue imaging or, you know, imaging uh, in a highly autofluorescent uh, samples, such as plant tissue. And it can be unbiased in, in case of direct sequencing of cDNA, uh, which is done in physique. Um, however, compared with single molecule fish, uh, the sensitivity is uh, lower uh, because you will lose many molecules during the, you know, the reverse transcription and other steps. So I just, you know, quickly um, went through uh, different types of technologies. And I think uh, important considerations in choosing an appropriate platform for, you know, the different projects would be, uh, you know, knowing what spatial resolution you need uh, and what is the size of the sample and also whether you want targeted or more unbiased approach and also very importantly uh, whether there is a commercial kit available um, so for all those three categories no three categories array single molecule fish and in situ sequencing there are a commercially available kits uh, so I, I think maybe in the, in the near future you can uh, more freely uh, choose appropriate platform for your for your, for your experiments. So so now today uh, I will give you one example in the use of spatial transcriptomics. Um, so we use the murfish, uh, which is a single molecule fish uh, based approach, and again we use this plant pathogen interaction system. Uh, we chose murfish because it has uh, you know high spatial resolution, the single cell or single molecule level resolution, which we thought to be critical because as you can see here, you know, the, the heterogeneity created by pathogen infection can be quite, you know, quite a lot and, you know, at the, and should be resolved at the single cell level because plant microbe interaction happens at the single cell level originally, initially. And so there's a commercially available Murfish platform. It's called Murscope. Uh, which can currently capture 500 genes at the same time. So I uh, manually created 500 gene panel, uh, including uh, leaf cell type markers and a bunch of different, you know, defense related genes or stress responsive genes and also many uh, transcription factors. And we have done time course murfish using pathogen infected uh, Rabidopsis leaf uh, using the time Time, time, time points completely matching to uh, the ones used in uh, the multi-ohm analysis that I showed earlier. So here uh, I'm showing all the transcripts detected in each sample. So there are millions of transcripts of 500 genes. So it, it's, a, it's a massive amount of data. And here I'm showing one example, uh, uh, LD1. Uh, this is a defense gene, and you can see nice induction of this gene over time and with some spatial structure. And you can also look at, you know, the multiple genes at the same time in space. So these are three genes. Uh, all, all, all of them are sort of related to uh, defense. So we didn't know much about their spatial coordination, but it turned out that you know, they, they are expressed in different cells and with some sp specific spatial organization. So, you know, looking at this could, you know, um, tell us about potential cell-cell interactions, you know, between cells uh, in different uh, sort of immune states. So that's pretty uh, exciting to, to see this. And so, so looking at, you know, each image uh, will be quite informative, but if we can go step one step farther to do more quantitative gene expression analysis at the single cell level. And for this, a critical step is cell segmentation. So in this study, uh, we trained a deep learning model to predict cell boundary structure purely based on the transcript distribution. And this segmentation allowed us to create a cell by gene matrix, which is 
the same data type as the single cell RNA seq, but each cell has a spatial coordinate x, y, z. In this case, z will be quite small because you know it's a very tiny, uh, the thin tissue section. Um, now, you know, it allows us to do single cell quantitative analysis. So we can, for example, uh, make a UMAP to do clustering. And also we can combine, integrate all the data set, uh, all the Murphish data set with single cell multi-ohm data set using the, 500, the shared 500 gene to make a unified map of all the cells uh, uh, captured by single cell multi-ohm and also Murphish. And, and the integration worked pretty well, as you can see in this two color UMAP. So they are the Murphish and multi cells are nicely integrated. And such integration allows us to use the Murphish cells as spatial anchors to spatially map the multi uh data onto the tissue. And what's good about this is that now you can spatially map uh, the whole transcriptome, not only 500 genes. It, you know, it's 20, 30,000 genes can be uh, spatially mapped. And also you can map um, um, the epigenome information, the ataxic information can be also mapped uh, uh, on the tissue. So this, just to show that, you know, such um, spatial mapping of multi um information uh, actually works, uh, we first tried to map those three major cell types identified in the multi um so epidermis, mesophyll, and vascular germ. And after data integration and a label transfer, we spatially mapped those cell type labels, and which resulted in this kind of picture. And you can see a very nice structure of vasculature, and then many of them are uh, mesophyll and some epidermis on the periphery. So this is exactly what we would expect uh, from you know our tissue section. So this indicates that uh, the data integration and spatial mapping uh, is working. So now we can try to map many other molecular features. For example, uh, if you remember, uh, I showed you that, you know, there are many uh, gene regulatory modules identified in the multi ohm data, WALKI-46 as an example. So we could, uh, for example, spatially map the WALKI-46 motif activity. So this is epigenetic, epigenome information. And then you can see heterogeneous distribution of cells with high WALKI-46 motif activity. You can also map one of the predicted target genes of WALKI46, ALD1, which also showed heterogeneous expression pattern. And th these two actually overlap pretty well, which means that you can spatially map the gene regulatory uh, uh, modules predicted by the multi -ion. So I'm not, today I'm not going to show you any you know, biological uh, conclusion, but you know, this will allow you to, to interrogate the, the molecular mechanisms at the single cell and spatial. Uh, resolution. So, um, as I showed you, there are a lot of opportunities um, using a spatial transcriptomics, um, but there are also limitations with currently available, I mean, commercially available technologies. And I think the, the biggest um, limitation is that you have to make tissue sections. The typically 10 micron, very, very thin tissue section is needed to do any sort of commercial spatial transcriptomic assay. And first of all, the sectioning is not easy, especially for a uh, tiny plant tissues, such as Arabidopsis root tip, which is a very important uh, tissue type for plant biologists. And also second, uh, if you cut a section, you're gonna lose all the rest of the tissue, which may contain important cell types or maybe microbes, you know, in my case. And then by, you know, if, if you lose, such information, the data interpretation in this two-dimensional uh, tissue section might be quite uh, difficult. That's why, uh, ideally, we should be able to do some sort of spatial transcriptomics in much thicker uh, tissue, such as whole mount tissue in 3D. And so that was the motivation behind uh, the development of new technology called Phytomap. So we map is the technology uh, we developed for uh, multiplex and single cell 3D spatial gene expression analysis that can work in whole mount plant tissue. So map is 
um, build up on the in situ sequencing uh, technologies. So that's a third category I introduced today. Um, so you use fixed plant tissue. And then, as I said, uh, the key step is the replacement of mRNAs with DNA by hybridizing um, the DNA probe with a gene specific barcode sequence. And the, such DNA probes are amplified in situ for hundreds of times and then tightly fixed. So it completely replaces mRNA. And then you perform single molecule fish targeting those uh, gene specific barcode sequence. And as I said, you know, the barcode sequences uh, have been amplified hundreds of times. So it, it will give you a very strong signal, which is critical for the deep tissue imaging, the whole mount imaging, and also imaging in, you know, highly, potentially highly autofluorescent uh, plant tissue. So here I'm showing the example of the actual signal you will see in fight map experiment in a small uh, area. And so each spot is a single molecule, single mRNA molecule derived and different color means uh, different genes. And so it, it goes through, you know, from top to the bottom of the tissue. And after each imaging, you can strip away the signal while still keeping the DNA uh, amplified DNA probe in, in, in situ. And then uh, using exactly the same tissue, uh, you can perform uh, another round of fish targeting different set of four genes. And you can you know, do this again and again until you image all the genes. So here I'm, I'm showing um, the actual uh, 3D uh, whole mount Rabidopsis root dip uh, with some, you know, put, um, cell type marker genes targeted. So uh, we use Rabidopsis root tip because it's a difficult tissue for sectioning. So for commercially available spatial transcriptomics. And I hope, you know, I, I hope that you can appreciate some specific signal coming from different uh, regions or cell types from the root. Here are some blown up images. So uh, with cell wall um, staining. So here you can see the signal uh, is coming from different layers, uh, different cell types in the root tip. So the fight map is uh, quite uh, target target specific. And one uh, application of fight map is that I think it can dramatically accelerate the class annotation and, and marker gene validation in single cell RNA seq. So if you have this uh, single cell data, and if you want to to annotate clusters or validate de novo identified marker genes, uh, I think. You know, the popular approach is to make transgenic lines um, one by one. But fight map allows you to grab, you know, dozens of genes at the same time and do one shot experiment uh, to, to validate all those genes at once. So even without making transgenic lines, so it can be done in, in a week or, or two. And in this preprint, um, we've demonstrated such a uh, use case, uh, which worked pretty well. It, uh, predict it with you know it detected uh, the de novo identified uh, root tip marker genes uh, from an expected area of the root. So just a quick summary of fight map, the key features. Uh, I, as far as I know, this is the only method that can do multiplex spatial gene expression analysis in a whole mount uh, 3D plant tissue. Uh, I mean, the dozens of genes can be captured. And the protocols are relatively straightforward. It's similar to more traditional in situ hybridization. So any molecular biology lab uh, can do it if you have confocal microscope, if you have access to confocal microscope. And it, the, the sample prep might take uh, four to five days, depending on the tissue type. And the cost is pretty low, uh, $80 per experiment. The initial investment cost will be a couple of thousand dollars to buy all the reagents, but you know, divided by the experiment number of experiments you can do, uh, it's going to be $80 per experiment. And then each experiment can accommodate many root tips, you know, because root tips are pretty small. So you can, you know, screen many different conditions and many different mutants at the same time. And, and then also very importantly, it's transgene free, uh, meaning that it could be applied to any existing mutants of Arabidopsis or any other uh, plant species, uh, including non-model plant species where the generation of transgenic lines are uh, difficult or not possible right now. 
Okay, so that was fight map. And uh, before finishing, I also wanted to mention that there are emerging technologies that allow spatial epigenomics or multi-omics. So here I highlight just one uh, type of uh, assay. It's called DBitC because I didn't mention earlier. So DBitSeq is also based on tissue sections uh, right now, uh, but it allows you to do some pre um, uh, sample pre processing, so including antibody labeling or TN5 tagging, and this allows you to 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 capture the spatial expression of protein, uh, spatial pattern of protein expression, or uh, spatial attack seek or cut and tag type of approach. The cut and tag is essentially a chip seek. So, and then you can combine this with the spatial transcriptomics. So, so now you will be able to uh, capture both spatially resolved gene expression and also epigenetic changes or protein um, expression or, you know, the transcription factor binding and, and so on. So maybe in, in, within a few years, uh, such type of application can be possible in plant tissue, which will be quite exciting. Okay, so uh, I just want to finish with sort of summarizing or giving you a perspective uh, that I think the single cell and spatial omics technologies have been accelerating the integration of genomics and cell biology in plant science. And as, as we all know, both genomics and cell biology has, have been quite important and powerful, and many people have combined, you know, those two technologies. Um, but, you know, usually, the you know, by while combining these two technologies, you know, we, we, we lose a lot of information. For example, when you do bulk RNA-seq to, you know, find a couple of interesting genes and then do some cell biology, the microscope experiment. That's uh, some popular experiments. But the question is, what about the, all the rest of the genes? So that's the information loss. But the spatial and single cell tech omics technologies will minimize that information loss by, you know, you know, enabling us to capture everything at once. And, and this really, you know, enables us to do more data-driven, um, you know, science, data, you know, hypothesis generation, hypothesis testing, and at the intersection of genomics and cell biology. And I'm very excited about this. And uh, hopefully this webinar give you some ideas about uh, your next uh, single cell or spatial omics uh, experiments. So with this, uh, I want to thank to everybody um, involved in the project I introduced today, um, especially my uh, PI, Joe Ecker, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, our uh, rotation student, Alex Mon Monell, uh, has, uh, was uh, spearhead, uh, spearheaded the analysis of spatial omics uh, data. And, and my colleague, Travis Lee, uh, performed the sectioning of the Arabidopsis leaf, which is not easy at all. And also I thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Joan Corey, uh, who allowed us to uh, use their great microscope and also our collaborator, Ryan Lister and Marina Oliva. And I also thank all the funding and uh, thank you for your attention. And I, I am happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pasia. Thanks for a wonderful webinar. And those phytomap images were really fascinating. Okay, so so without uh, wasting any time, so I'll start uh, asking the questions. So first question is, do you usually validate the cluster annotation in single cell RNA-seq like by RNA in situ hybridization? And there is any possible possible method to validate the cluster annotations for single cell ATAC-seq? Yeah, so um, I mean, in many cases, if, you know, very confident marker genes are available. We can just rely on the known marker genes to annotate uh, or annotate uh, your cluster. It's not really usually possible to uh, validate every single cluster you identify. So unless, you know, the cluster is really important for your uh, study. Um, but fight, I think fight map will be quite powerful in really, you know, accelerating such uh, cluster annotation uh, problem. Uh, as I introduced. And for the second question, the uh, validation for the ataxic based cluster. Um, so in our case, we since we used um, the multi-ohm, so I always use RNA data to perform clustering and do annotation. So we didn't rely 
on ataxic data for any uh, clustering or um, you know the um, cluster annotation. But I mean, in principle, it's possible to uh, use ataxic data for cluster annotation because you know the open chromatin region could associate with the gene expression in many cases. So you can predict the expression of gene based based on the ataxic data, and then you can ask whether you know what what you know, in which cell type this, this gene might be expressed. Okay, thank you. Next question, did you use a tool for transcription factor target gene linking, for example, WRKY46 to its target? So the linking, so there are packages. Um, uh, so the package I use is called SINIAC, uh, S-I-G, NAC, CINIAC, uh, developed by uh, Tim Stewart in the Satija lab. And also for the motif enrichment analysis, I used a package called uh, ChromeVar, uh, which was developed by uh, William Greenleaf lab at Stanford. Right, thank you. Uh, so next question is, have you observed the real-time trajectory of certain cell clusters since your samples were collected in a time series? Yes, um, I didn't show you the data, but we did try to um, understand the sort of the immune trajectory, the temporal dynamics of immune responses. And so we applied pseudodime analysis, uh, which is commonly used in developmental uh, questions to infer, you know, development the trajectory, but we use it to sort of uh, infer that what I call immune trajectory. And actually, it, I think I accurately predicted the actual uh, temporal dynamics of immune responses, which was validated by the real time data, as you suggested. So didn't have time to show you, but um, we'll post the preprint soon. So hope you can check this out. Okay, thank you. How do you tackle the fact that in molecular cartography, uh, you usually have only a few genes measured compared to the thousands of genes measured in single cell RNA-seq data set? Right. So depending on the, you know, depending on which genes you choose, but you know, the hundred, uh, several hundred genes uh, might be sufficient for the accurate uh, integration between this, you know, targeted special gene expression, special omics data and more unbiased single cell RNA-seq uh, data. So, but it, it all depends on, you know, the complexity of your tissue and, then, and also your panel design. But the, my point is, you know, the whole transcriptome spatial mapping is not necessarily uh, needed for successful integration of different data set. Okay. What is the limit of detection for Murphy's technique? Limit of detection. So I think, well, there are multiple uh, limitations. One is, um, the common problem is called overcrowding because it's a, a image-based technique. So if you target transcripts that are too abundant in the tissue, you know the, all the spots may be you know overcrowded, and you might not be able to distinguish individual spots derived from single molecules. So that can affect the quantitative analysis of uh, Murphy's. And also, you know the very lowly expressed genes may not be captured by Murphy's. Although, as I said, single molecule fish has a really high sensitivity, so this may not be a huge problem. Um, that's the yeah some limitation in terms of detection. Did you lose some cells during integration of spatial data with multiomics, transcript, transcriptomics, and ataxic? So the, no, because in the multi-om, both information comes together in, in the same cell. So you don't, you don't lose. So if you have maybe separate uh, RNA and a toxic data set, you might, you know, some cells might not integrate very well. So, it, you know, which could be called as a loss, loss of genes. But the advantage of multi-om is that you, you can get both modality from the same cell. How much of the spatial distribution of gene activation is due to heterogeneity of the pathogen delivery method in two leaves? I think the pathogen distribution explains a lot. Um, actually, we didn't show today, but um, 
we also targeted pathogen genes using MERFish to try to locate where the pathogens are, which was uh, successful. And then it showed that, you know, indeed, pathogen distribution explains a lot about the spatial heterogeneity uh, um, of immune gene activation. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Okay, so next question is, can such a single cell analysis be technically performed on plant suspension cultures? Yes, um, I mean, analogous to human cell culture uh, research, you know, there are, you know, many, most of the techniques can be applied to uh, culture cells. So maybe, you know, the protoplast can be used for uh, any, you know, high throughput sequencing based assay. Maybe it's not, it doesn't make much sense to do spatial uh, assay in the culture cell unless you have specific, specifically designed uh, experimental setup. But uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's possible. Okay, so probably given the time, this would be the last question I would take. This is a comment and a question. So thanks for sharing your work. I enjoy the seminar a lot. One question for the microbe plant interaction section. Could you map the spatial information of pathogen in the data? For phytomap, if, a, if applied to leaf tissue, would you expect the autofluorescence of chloroplast affect, affecting the signal? Yeah, so the first question, first part has been already answered. So it's possible to map pathogen distribution as well. That's so the dual mapping of plant gene expression and pathogen will be a super uh, exciting feature area. And for the second part, um, in the leaf, the chlor chlorophyll autofluorescence is not a big issue because during the fixation and other processes, actually the chlorophyll Plast will be destroyed and you know melt away. So there's no chloroplast chlorophyll autofluorescence. Uh, the major source of autofluorescence will be the cell wall, uh, which could be a problem. But again, because the target will be amplified many times, then you know which will give you a strong signal. And usually, I didn't ex experience any uh, problem uh, from autofluorescence in the leaf or root. Okay, thank you again for, for today's webinar. And thanks a lot, everyone, for joining today and asking uh, so many interesting questions. Bye -bye. Thank you.